So thanks for coming everyone to Cases Over Cocktails, the CHIP case series. My name is Katie Dawson. I am one of the uh, first year interventional fellows at the University of Washington, and I'll be the CHIP fellow starting in gosh, two weeks at um, uh, UW as well. Um, I was just about to say, oh, hi, Dr. Alice Webb. Nice hi. to meet you. <laughs> I'm Katie. Nice um, Catherine called me and told me that you guys had a kind of an emergency that she was yeah. um, probably going to be tied up in that for a little bit. Yes, me too. But like, uh, I could get, um, so I am still at the hospital and Catherine is, but um, we, so we split. I'm going to come work with you and Catherine will be by the patient. Okay. Um, I have her slides. I, um, I'm happy to try to muddle through them when I get through mine. Um, yeah. Though um, your presence is greatly appreciated. <laughs> yeah, left main PCI. Let's talk yeah. about left main exactly. PCI. Okay, so I'll start with my cases. Um, I have two. So case number one is a 79 year old male who came to clinic with, to an, another clinic at another hospital in the city of Seattle with, um, about six months of chest pain, which had been unresponsive to medical therapy. He had undergone a myocardial perfusion study in the outpatient setting, which had shown some anterior wall ischemia. And so that in combination with his angina being unresponsive to medical therapy, he um, was referred for diagnostic angiography as an outpatient. Uh, so these are his initial shots and I have some additional caudal views as well as a picture of his RCA on the next slide. But, um, you can see here that it, on his diagnostic imaging, it appeared that his left main was quite short. And as such, they had some challenges um, engaging the guide and getting pictures that didn't have a ton of blowback. But I think you can pretty well see here, particularly in the zoomed up image on the um, right, that he has a short left main and what appears to be um, calcified disease, which involves probably the osseum of the LAD and maybe the osseum of the circumflex. It was a little bit hard for us to tell when we got the referral exactly how much of each branch was involved, but certainly at least seemed to involve the LAD. Yeah, this is, this is again a typical example about the limitation of angiography in left main disease. We really cannot tell if there is left main or no left main, if there is a uh, common ostea, and if there is a left main, or is the disease extend into osseal LAD and osseal cirque or just an osseal cirque? Is, this is a, a, a quite an example about the limitation of angiography in a left main. And, and, uh, and that's kind of brings, we're going to talk about it later during this, how you're going to have to use other adjunctive um, technology to basically figure this out. <clears throat> um. And in his caudal views, which you can see here, one caudal view that I have pulled up, the circumflex, it wasn't really clear, like you had discussed as well, how much it was really involved or if there was eccentric plaque that isn't well seen in the caudal view. Um, and though this is not a multivessel PCI talk, in addition to his left main disease, he also had a disease in his proximal RCA. Um, so he was actually, directly admitted to the hospital from the, his outpatient angiogram after these findings. Um, he had a pretty rocky course after these diagnostic films were done before we actually met him. When he was admitted to this outside hospital, they consulted cardiac surgery because despite being 79, he was otherwise actually pretty healthy. Um, and they thought that it would be reasonable for to consider him for cabbage. He was actually taken to the OR about two days after his, this diagnostic angiogram was performed. They got as far as the sternotomy and it seems as though perhaps no preoperative imaging of his chest was done. And so the fact that he had a porcelain aorta was unappreciated uh, prior to doing a sternotomy. So he, they opened him up, saw that he had a porcelain aorta and didn't feel like they could do a cross clamp reading the notes there seems to have been a discussion regarding whether or not they could get away with an off pump bypass. Um, but when they pulled down his Lima, they both felt it was too small and 
had insufficient reach to do a uh, lima to LED graft. So they actually Catherine, does he have diabetes? No, um, he okay. was actually like basically otherwise healthy. Um, so this is this is a typical example how we don't really use the syntax scoring, right? If you if you want to guesstimate what his syntax score is, what do you think his syntax score? Oh, great question that I didn't prepare. I mean, it's probably it's not that high. Not I don't think high. his syntax I mean, score is like left main bifurcation, but it does yeah. not. Even if it's true bifurcation, it does not seem to be complex. In fact, this is the only time I would basically use probably V stenting and or use kind of a tab or or culotte. It's not a big deal. You can if, if you have a two millimeter left main, it's not a big deal. And as RCA, it's a single proximal lesion. Yeah. It's angulated, but it's not really that difficult, right? And it calcified. So in the syntax trial. And uh, in the syntax two afterward, in a patient like this, it would have been a fair game to do either PCI or a cabbage, right? And 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 uh, so I wouldn't like there are there are kind of knee jerk reflex patient like this patient with three vessel disease or left main. In fact, the left main is no longer a, a, a merely surgical disease unless you're talking about the distal left main. Yeah. This is could be called the sort of distal left main, but it's still actually at 79, a patient who basically uh, have a huge circ, a huge LED. You can put at least four or four or five millimeter stents. I'm not sure this is um, this is should be um, a re, kind of a dramatic referral to surgery. Yeah, I think we have that same discussion um, here fairly frequently that. Um, especially given the advent of imaging guided PCI and given his age, it's very treatable percutaneous disease. It didn't seem like he was having symptoms that really necessitated an urgent admission. It sounds like, as you said, it was kind of a knee jerk. Oh my gosh, he has left mean disease. Let's admit him to the hospital. And um, and, and I ask about surgery, diabetes particularly because three vessel disease and diabetes, they do better with surgery. We know that. There is no discussion about that. This is a clinical trial, freedom trial showed that. Although the freedom trial, 87% of the patient had three vessel disease, not two. Uh, the two vessel disease were actually 13% of the time. And they have diabetes. So those patients do better with Lima to the, but I'm not sure this patient does not have diabetes. He would have done really good with uh, PCI. That's right. And um, particularly his post-operative course was quite challenging, which is how he found his way to our doorstep. He um, was admitted to their ICU after the sternotomy was closed and basically had like copious amounts of bleeding from his chest tubes. Um, he ultimately, his crit dropped from like the mid thirties to 19 and he received five units of PRBCs, several units of platelets and some cryoprecipitate. Um, and for these reasons, they obviously were quite concerned about doing any additional interventions at their hospital. Um, and so in addition to his bleeding, he was also having ongoing angina, likely related to his ongoing anemia, but they felt like he needed an urgent revascularization and assessment and transferred him to us. Um, when he got to us, he was having ongoing chest pain, but we were able to manage it with a nitroglycerin drip um, we actually consulted our cardiac surgeons, not necessarily to reconsider bypass surgery, but to say, hey, he's still having a lot of bleeding out of these chest tubes. By the time he got to us, it had been over five days since his surgery. There were some delays because of bed issues. Um, and so we were quite concerned that he could need a, another surgical intervention simply to address why he was bleeding so much. Um, his he had a cardiogram when he arrived. His EF had at that point dropped to 35%. It had previously been 55%. Uh, he had some minor wall motion abnormalities. It was largely global. And ultimately he did not need a surgical washout. And by post-op day five on our end, the bleeding had slowed down. We had him off of pressors and he had tolerated a plavix load. So we had planned on doing a um, PCI the following Monday provided that he didn't require any additional blood transfusions after the plavix load, which he did not. So these are our um, initial, initial setup shots. 
Uh, and you can see we had kind of a similar issue with visualization that the diagnostic angiograms had at the time of his initial uh, angiography. So I guess I would pause at this point um, and just see what people think about how they would approach this lesion. We kind of talked about the timing. We were quite concerned about his bleeding risk with all of his surgical bleeding complications that he had had, um, whether or not he needed an atherectomy. Given his EF decline, should we consider MCS? You can see in front of you his um, filling pressures, which were done via a right heart cath at the time of his intervention. Um, Is there any uh, the audience can participate? They should be able to. I don't know if there's a. Okay, so there are 21 participants. Um, who's moderating uh, the, the IT? Uh, John Michael on our end is moderating the um, okay. IT. So, so the, the question now, so I would start with from the guide, right? You are doing bifurcation, uh, uh, left main in a calcified vessel, right? So the, the um, and I see you guys put a right heart probably, and the chest tube is obvious there. You want to know if there is a hypovolemia, if the patient. So it, this is all good. So I will start from the sheath choice to the guide choice uh, and access choice in a complex situation like this. So I kind of tell, like you guys started with, a, this is a 45 centimeter bright tip sheath in there. Do you yes. see that, like the bright tip? 45 centimeter sheath. And this is a H French guide, Catherine? It is an H French guide, that's right. Of course. So uh, if you, the, the problem with trying to minimize your guide in a complex cases like this is going to be long and really, tor um, uh, it's going to be a lot of torture, not to the patient only, it's only on, also to the operator because you're going to have to do kissing stenting, you're going to have to use high pressure balloons. These are big vessels, you're gonna to have to use big st stands and big actually kissing balloons and trying to get those through six French or through even seven French sometimes, it's really difficult. Calcified vessel, let's say, God forbid you got a perforation, you need to have an access to another wire, another balloon, and you can deliver a papyrus stent with another. So I don't think um, in, a, in the days and age of the now what PCI is done for actually extremely high risk procedure, uh, high risk lesions, as opposed to what we done until recently, we did actually the type A and B lesions, the low risk lesions that actually have no benefits until we found out there is no actually benefit from opening these lesions versus medical therapy. We never had a testing where we have all these lesions here tested. So, um, and these are complex by definition, 79 years old. So you better be prepared. And if you're worried about not get uh, access to bleeding with eight French versus six French, that means you're not practicing um, best uh, practice for accessing the, the groin. You have to use ultrasound and, and, um, and fluoroscopy. So then after that, you're gonna talk about the strategy of what to do with a bifurcation stinting. There are zillions of strategies you can ap approach this. And regardless of what you do, you're never gonna be able to figure out what to do without intravascular imaging. That's right. Yeah, and, it, and um, from my hospital, I know that Dr. Kate Carney is on, so I'm happy to- um, Is Kate her. here? Okay. Yeah, she looks like she's in here. I'm happy to have her weigh in as well regarding um, like our typical approach to this sort of thing. But my experience, um, at least in the first year has been that, yeah, we typically go with eight French guides from the groin when we're worried about high risk cases like this, where we're kind of, you know, going to war and gonna really try to get the job done as efficiently as possible. Um, and we, as you said, like typically always use ultrasound fluoroscopy and micropuncture access for the groins, trying to minimize those complications as much as possible. Um, so that was what we did here. Um, yeah, I think they gave me the power to unmute. So <laughs> I'll just jump in and say, I agree that for us, you know, I think there's, it's sort of twofold. I mean, for bleeding avoidance strategies, radial would make sense, but it was also one of those that 
they had some difficulties um, anyway. And I think efficiency was really important to us because the thing I was most concerned about is kind of writing his heparin at a level that we can get through the case and get him through this so he can move in bed without having angina on a high dose nitro drip, um, but not start dumping into his chest tubes again, given all of those issues. So I think weighing all of that, you know, our complication rate is so low because all the fellows are as neurotic as Cal and I are about access kind of learned how to do it that way that, um, you know, we're pretty comfortable with that. So just if we think it's going to give a clear advantage that we'll go for it. Perfect. Um, okay, I'll just leave you on. Um, so for this gentleman, like uh, Kate was talking about, we did his upfront um, right heart cath at the time of the procedure. And while his EF had declined since his initial presentation, his filling pressures were actually quite good. Uh, and his thickened cardiac index, while not completely normal, was not terrible. And weighing the risk of anticoagulation in this guy who had had a lot of surgical bleeding, uh, we elected not to place upfront mechanical support to try to minimize need for heparin after the procedure. Uh, we didn't have it in the room at the time, just as, you know, kind of a knock on wood sort of thing, but ultimately did not put any sort of impella device in at the time of the intervention. And just, you know, to cut to the chase, we did treat the RCA first because it was relatively straightforward just to take it off the table. Um, and I, and I, that's actually low hanging fruit, relatively speaking, okay. relatively speaking, if you run into trouble with uh, fixing the left main you don't have a backup system unless you have the RCA is treated already. So that's, I, I think, I think, um, I think that's actually the better strategy to, to kind of take the low, the, the lesion that have less lower risk, technical risk, uh, technical complexity um, and get done with them because this is your backup. Yeah, that was our thought as well. You know, give him that perfusion to that vessel. It was very straightforward. We did a cutting balloon and stented and moved on with the left main intervention. Um, from For the left main, I we did not capture it, but we actually did initially try to put an IVIS catheter down the LED, uh, but it wouldn't pass beyond the kind of proximal segment where the most calcified lesion was. So we did do upfront rotational atherectomy with a 175 burr, uh, went through two passes, it passed pretty easily. And then we post dilated with a 30NC from the left main into the LED. Our kind of initial thoughts on this were that the image in the middle is the LED IVIS, um, and wait till it kind of recycles and you can see it from the beginning. But this is obviously post rota rotational atherectomy and post initial post dilation with a 30NC. But um, it is mostly calcified, sorry, excuse me one second. Um, when you get back to the ostium of the LED and into the left main, that's kind of the ostium there right before it pops into the left main. Uh, it was really short, so you don't see much of the left main from that view. The IVIS images on the right is the circumflex, and we kind of come in and out of it during, during the end because we were trying to better assess the takeoff of the circumflex from the left main to determine if it was involved enough that it would need to be scented as well. And actually right here, what you can see is um, that is kind of the most stenotic part, which is kind of just getting back into the left main. It's somewhat calcified, but not remarkably so. So we actually elected to have for our initial strategy to be upfront predilation of both vessels and then a provisional scenting from the left main into LAD with a plan to jailbreak the CERC. That's perfect. <clears throat> Just highlighting, you know, what you were saying, Dr. Alaswa, but obviously the Pre-procedural imaging here is really crucial when you can't really assess necessarily what's going on in the vessel. Once you do the IVIS and now you have, I think you have an adequate lumen and, and now you open, actually you change the strategy immediately. Instead of, we were thinking Coolot and uh, Dr. Uh, Nayal Bor Borges uh, had a comment, nice comment here. He said, I will exclude crush. And I agree with him. Um, 
um, I will exclude the crush, like t- uh, knowing the, the, the short left main, you're really not a crush. Either going to have to be a tab or kind of modified, really minimum cool lot, yeah. which is my, my preference. But my preference now, especially after the EB, <laughs> EBC trial, is actually single stint strategy. And I, I, that was my actually initial approach to every left main. If I could get away with a single stint strategy, that what would I do? And now, basically, single stint strategy here is very viable, knowing now the imaging told us that. Um, so this is just some initial, some images of the um, kind of pre-dills after rotational atherectomy just into the LED. We hit both uh, vessel ostium with a cutting balloon, both of which expanded well. And then this was just a, I thought a nice image of kind of the stent extending back into the left main and positioning it. And you can really appreciate how short it was. Uh, and then the shot on the right is after the stent deployment, it was a 4 by 20 synergy with a, and post dilated with a 4-5 NC. Perfect. So, this is a view to get actually the osteum of the left main. I will go a little bit more cranial. You'll see the osteum of the left main. You see the lower lip, the proximal and the distal lip. And I line it with the lip closer to the left main, to the valve aortic valve and it will be um that's actually very very good view i find it very useful how about you kate yeah we almost always land them that way um that's probably a trick i learned from you actually he had this weird uh, the angle of his takeoff was such as he had terrible overlap in the yeah. view, unfortunately so um our but I, oh, that almost always saves us. So this one was a little bit weird and made us a little more Twisted. nervous actually in checking with Ivis and all that kind of stuff just because the cranny shot didn't help as much. And I agree, that's much easier to rely on typically. Yeah, yeah. and we had a um, Sydney shot of the cranny positioning and exactly what you guys said. It's why I didn't really include yeah. it, but perhaps- I think it, the search just kept getting in the way. No, it's really annoying. Yeah, and, and, uh, and the swan guns always comes in the way. Oh. Yeah, right, that too. Um, so we removed the circumflex wire with a plan to rewire the circ. And I think the other interesting thing about this case, which you can see here in the cranial shot on the left is after the wire came out, the flow into the circumflex is clearly quite sluggish, like to me one, to me two. And I think going back to the, um, stent deployment picture, you can kind of get a sense of that. He and I were talking about this earlier. When you look at it again, it's not as robust as it was before. Um, and then yeah, so- no, it was clearly going down. I think we potted and then um, and maybe post dilated and it got worse, but it's one of those. We were planning to rewire it, but it, it definitely showed some signs of that and then got very clear in this picture now. So this is, a, this is basically a, a provocative uh, uh, question here. Do you think the predilation in the circ caused this. Like what 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 could have happened if you just did not predilate the circ, just yeah. chilled the wire? That's actually one of my takeaways when Katie and I were talking about this earlier, that I think one of the dangers of imaging is there was enough disease and I was hoping to keep this pretty s- quick case again because of the heparin issues and bleeding and stuff and figured, well, either way, you know, a culotte wouldn't would be our strategy, so it wouldn't change things dramatically. But I do wonder if we just made things worse by pretreating. You know, it was focal enough that it might have just been fine, even though it doesn't look good on imaging. Yeah, I've, I've had that, like done an FF, uh, IFR, FFR after jailing a side branch. Mm-hmm. And it's like confirming the, the, the trial I read and can't believe until I see with my own eyes. Actually, we've had a very good success of finding that the FFR, IFR is actually fine so you don't have to do anything i always i always have something in me says but you have to kiss final kiss the reason is what if the patient develops STEMI in that circ and there is a struts in there and someone come in the middle of the night to open that circ and now they cannot deliver their balloon past my stent and i'm not sure of that valid anxiety but yeah, no, it's true. I think you could argue in this case, we would have been better off leaving it alone, actually, because there's not a whole lot of reason for a lot of shift otherwise, I don't think. But, 
So after that, we then rewired the CERC, um, in, did initial jailbreak with a 2.0 compliant balloon, and then did a kissing balloon inflation with a 3.5 NC in the LED and a 3.0 NC in the CERC. Um, and then did an, another angiography, which showed great improvement in the flow to the circumflex. So we did not um, end up doing a tap or a short culotte in this case. And I think one of the things that Kate and I were talking about earlier was would other people have done it differently? Would other people have felt obligated to cover um, the osteal circ after the flow decreased like that? Um, I'd be interested to hear other people's thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. It's like, but the IVIS will tell you, right? <clears throat> so if you have a wire and you have, obviously you have either, you have carina shift and a plaque shift that caused it. Then if you balloon it and you IVIS and that's all what you have, I think you're good. But if you have a, if you have a flow limiting dissection that you ballooned it, you could actually tack it. But this is from the old days of angioplasty, right? This is the nightmare of the uh, intervention cardiologist back then before we have stents. They dilate with the balloon and they wait and they sit and wait and wait and wait and wait. And they go home and they have to rush back in the middle of the night. Uh, patient on heparin and warfarin, there are so many trials to kind of figure out how to keep the artery open until someone came up with the ideas of a stent and um, they, they come in back. So I think imaging here is the answer. Yeah, and I don't. Yeah, I actually don't think we repeated it into no, the work. Um, I think we just did our final one from LED. But yeah, you're right. I mean, that was always the issue before. Um, you know, the benefit and the curse of our training is we always have Bill Lombardi in our ear. I don't know if he's on <laughs> from Alaska, but uh, he often talks about how the other big factor there is DAP. So, as you know, all the dissections we have in the CTO space, if it's such that it looks like that and it's not flow limiting, we you know, generally feel pretty comfortable leaving them undapped, but I think it's a really valid point that you understand the mechanism better if, if we do that. Um, in his case, you know, we were kind of trying to wrap up and- So this patient still have through. chest tubes. I'm gonna try to get away without having bifurcation stenting as much as I can. So yeah, I, would I say agree with your strategy. Case, yeah, in his case, we were, you know, I was really reluctant given the way that flow looked and to just get out of there kind of given the bleeding issues yeah. um, to do a late culotte. But we were, you know, when it first went down, we kind of started calling for all the gear, just figuring we were going to. So I, I don't know that what we did is right necessarily, but fortunately he did well, at least short term. Perfect. Would you, Kate, did you use, what kind of your anticoagulation strategy during the procedure in a patient like this? Yeah, we actually, we talked about that. I almost never use bivalrudin in our lab. That's just not common. I know other places use it a lot more. It was one of the cases we actually discussed it a bit, but we sort of ultimately just had the other issue with that is just what to do afterwards if we have any problems. And because we're so much more comfortable giving protamine, um, you know, on DAPT if we have a good result. Now we figured to some degree, we were almost more comfortable doing that. So we ended up do, using heparin and just rather than just, you know, giving our big bolus doses, kind of titrate a little bit more cautiously than normal. Um, but I'm interested, what would you have done? I, I actually use, I, I went back to using bival rudin um, more often. So I that, so I grew up as an intervention cardiologist in an era where bival rudin was so much pushed. And I, I cannot remember from that era, we have a lot less bleeding complications. In fact, we were yeah. able to send every patient home about 87% of the time. We send same day discharges in the PCI, non-STEMI of course, non-STEMI and, uh, and, and STEMI patient are excluded. Uh, we were able to send them and using bival rudin from a groin axis. And this is kind of the, 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 the kind of patient might benefit from it in my opinion. There are data about the low bleeding risk and, and honestly, um, uh, perforation with bivalrudin, uh, the thing about bivalrudin is like uh, the blood clots. If it sits in the pericardium, mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to clot, but um, in the same time, uh, the bivalrudin is not effective and, and, and it's, the bleeding stops. Um, um, similar as if you give, um, um, but this is a patient I would consider it. Um, I would consider bivalrudin. Not necessarily, I have a lot of data, tons of data to support it, but that's, yeah. Excellent yeah, case. Did the patient go I, home? 
Yes, uh, he actually did quite well. He discharged from the hospital three days after our PCI, which was largely related to getting the chest tubes out and monitoring him to make sure that there were no additional complications in that arena. Um, his EF had recovered into the mid 40s prior to discharge and he saw one of our outpatient cardiologists a few weeks ago and was doing quite well with no complaints. Um, so a good result, though a harrowing um, trip there, I suppose. That awesome. So uh, uh, Dr. Conkle joined us, which is good. That's either good news or bad news. I don't know. Uh. We're stable. Okay, stable. Good. So that's good news then. Um, and um, and um, uh, I don't know. You guys know who's next, so be happy to kind of sit and listen. Catherine, I'm happy to do whatever you want. I have a second case. Um, if you think you might get pulled away again and want to do one of yours, I think I have a window of opportunity right now. Perfect. So. I will stop um, my screen so yep. that you can um, get to that. Great. Okay. okay, you should be good. Great, okay. So um, my case is, but the first case I prepared, it's a 64 year old gentleman. He has a history of coronary disease, non-sustained VT, ischemic cardiomyopathy with an EF of 35%, AFib hyperlipidemia and obesity. Um, he has class three angina and was recently admitted for unstable angina. Here's his home meds. So um, he's on a beta blocker. That's his only anti-anginal. A recent echo shows an EF of 35%, no regional wall of motion abnormalities, no valvular lesions. So during that admission um, for the um, his um, acute coronary syndrome, he had this angiogram. And so, you know, initially we're obviously seeing a lot of proximal calcification in the distal left main. Obviously in the first angiogram, the thing that's jumping out at you is this proximal circumflex lesion. Um, you know, as we're looking a little more, you see there's a mid LED lesion right after that very large diagonal that's again quite calcified um, right by that septal. We really don't see kind of the, the bifurcation of the left main and LED very well on the initial angiograms um, here. So here's our spider. And again, a bit difficult to see. It looks like there's a high rising obtuse marginal um, Kind of the involvement of that, not exactly clear. It's There's some diffuse disease there. Um, here's a little bit more AP caudal of a view. So definitely some distal left main disease, um, some osteocircumflex disease, some mid LED disease, um, and his right fairly unremarkable and intermediate lesion at the crux, but really nothing to do there. Um, so the patient was initially recommended to um, C surgery, he was not amenable for cardiac surgery and referred for evaluation. So I guess initial thoughts would be, how would you kind of approach this anatomy? You know, do we need to address the LAD? Do we need to address kind of, how are we gonna handle this osteocirc and distal left main? There's a lot of calcium, um, you know, is there a role for atherectomy here? If so, what modality? And are we gonna have to tackle a trifurcation in the distal left main? So just kind of some initial kind of thoughts as we saw this patient. I don't know if anyone on the panel had any comments at this point, or I can keep going. I'm gonna throw it to Kate because I, it's my patient, so. <laughs> I was gonna say this might be your case. Can you go you back? Remember what you, you know what you did? I can't remember actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one was and I've looked at all of her slides already. So. Yeah. Can you go back to your shot of the left system? Yeah, of course. I can try. Yeah, I think for starters, you know, as a early operator, when I'm going through these cases in this exact type of scenario, I always had, you know, this like six ways that I'm going to treat all the branches and bifurcation strategies. And in general, the, you know, senior guys in our lab are kind of talking me down off the ledge a little bit of keeping it a little simpler. And thinking back to our earlier conversation is always this balance between your efficiency of the case, you know, making sure you get what you need today. 
so that you don't spend so long on, you know, a smaller branch and trying to perfect that to the point where the patient's like coming off the table and you're still trying to, to treat the bulk of their disease. Um, so I think with these, you know, it's, it's a little ambiguous. Um, and we're looking at here, it looks calcified enough to me that I would not be at all surprised if you needed atherectomy for the proximal portion of the LED. Um, I think how to do that is dealer's choice in our lab. A lot of times that would be kind of a mid-sized burr and see if that gets you enough to frack the calcium. Um, the angles into the circumflex are, are always a piece of it. And we are just talking recently that that ostium of the circ in particular just seems so vulnerable to the instant restenosis. If you, so I, I'm much more mindful about that, whether right or wrong, just because of what we see there. You know, in terms of the additional branches coming off of there, usually a lot of times I'll try to get away with a provisional and jailbreak that to keep things moving. Um, but I think just like the other cases, you know, and the imaging is kind of where you make your final decisions. And so going into these, this type of case, I kind of have a plan A and a plan B about, but I would expect that the circ is diseased enough that I'm going to be treating that. And because of the angles, um, I'm going to worry about getting adequate prep and maybe stunting from left mean, um, from the circ back into, back into the left mean, just because you're recrossing and everything into the LED is going to be good. If it's really severe, then in your, uh, to the point where you're worried about stent fracture or a big problem there, then you might avoid that. But I think it's harder to get um, a perfect result in the circ as well. So I don't know, it's just my first two cents, but what did you think, Kel? agree with you. I think um, I'm, I'm actually, <laughs> I can't remember what actually I did, but um, uh, I suspect we're going to need a lot of atherectomy. And I tend sometimes if I can get away, I get away with treating the inflow and get done with it or treating one vessel. And I always, there is another day to come back and, and, uh, and fight. Um, I'm not sure. I can't really remember what I've done in this, what we've done in this. Uh, um, so Catherine? Can you tell us what we, what we, how we approach this? Even better. I think that is a good point. We just came up on our CAF conference today with the surgeons is we have the benefit of coming back to do more work. And so I think kind of prioritizing what you need to give the patient, you know, stability and angina relief for the immediate future. And then having a plan that makes sense where you can do additional work that is going to work with your initial strategy is probably better than always figuring that you're going to tackle everything in one day. Yeah, I think Catherine froze, her computer oh. froze. <laughs> so uh, let's say until her computer fixed. So the biggest territory here is probably the LAD. And, yeah. and, and I, would, I would think I would basically make sure secure that the LAD is is safe and if I need an atherectomy. So what would you do in an atherectomy? Do you wire both vessels and now trying to protect the wire? What, 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 how you approach this? Yeah, a lot of times in these, I think of which one am I gonna be nervous about rewiring after I've done atherectomy on both, if, if either. And so I'd probably start into the LED of course, if you do have no reflow or dissection or something, you, you might have to balloon. But a lot of times, you know, we'll just get that done and then move on to the circ because that LED looks like it, your angles are, are such that I wouldn't be as worried about rewiring that. And then, then you just have control over them for the best, um, mm -hmm. um, you know, for the rest of the case. But that's probably the order I would do it in there. Absolutely. And I, and I think, and I, think I, I would always consider if there is a dissection, and I lost the wire there, how easy to wire it again. Mm -hmm. And one time, I, what I do sometimes, I actually uh, stint, but not cross the ostium. Mm -hmm. So if you worried about this, uh, like let's say I put the wire in the circ and did a uh, atherectomy and I'm done, and now there is a really horrendous dissection. So now I'm gonna put a stint in the circ uh, enough and open it enough to ensure Timmy three flow, and then not across the ostium. And then because if the stent is less likely to shut down immediately, this is one. And second, you can actually, if it shut down, you have a big stent, you can actually poke toward it and, and get through it and go then. But I would avoid putting two wires and atherectomy next to other wire. So, um, and, yeah, I think that's become popularized with the idea of putting like a, you know, plastic microcatheter down and there's probably a few scenarios where that maybe that makes sense, but we, I mean, it looks like it still gets chewed up and you have 
breeze. So I think unless you're extraordinarily worried, that probably doesn't make sense. Um, that's a good point. We had a case recently where there was just a little landing zone in the Cirque and it looked like all the torturosity and some of the other stuff was going to be kind of a mess. So we just wrote it and stunted that all the way back. Um, and it was one of those things that when we were landing it, there's a little bit of a gut check to be sure that I'm not hanging out into the left main because it was like the one thing that we were concerned the angles were a little bit tough to lay out. Um, but that was really nice and just gave us a lot more confidence that when we had to recross that that part was already dealt with because it was nasty enough that I didn't really want to have to be doing that right. after the fact. Yeah. Catherine, uh, Catherine oh. Kunkel is back. Mm -hmm. Sorry, in addition to everything else, we're having pan hospital rolling Wi-Fi outages. <laughs> it's always the best. You know, you win some, you lose some. Um, so sorry, I missed a little bit, but um, so what we did here is we started actually with um, CSI of the LAD. And we, we had kind of two distinct lesions. There was that mid LED lesion um, as well as the proximal LED lesion. So we, we CSI'd the mid lesion and then we did kind of the Viper slide um, back to the or, um, Dynaglide, um, back to the proximal LED and then treated backwards into the left main. Um, and so, um, you know, here's kind of an angiogram of what that looked like afterward. Um, and then we moved on to do CSI um, around this corner into the CERC. Um, I don't know if um, either of you wanted to talk about kind of your choice on atherectomy modalities in the CERC with this extreme angle. I feel like it's something that I, I certainly think about a lot um, and have, I guess, this year tended to move toward um, to CSI a little bit more, but this is always kind of a bit of a, a nerve wracking curve to make. I was gonna ask the same, UW is a very rota heavy lab. Um, and so I have more, definitely have more experience in that arena, but I'd definitely be curious to hear that. Yeah, I think it depends a little bit on, you know, what the torturosity is like the teaching of is probably much better than us at CSI, but I think the teaching's always worried about severe torturosity, but I think of that more in vessels where it's such a severe curvature that you have a lot of straightening artifact. I mean, this one is just such that the angles are that, you know, kind of no matter what, there might be issues, but if you wrote that, you're going to have a big gutter there, so you better be prepared to see that and have dissection planes and et cetera. Um, I always thought CSI was better when you're dealing with that calcium on the inner curve. I know Akiko recently told me that based off their imaging stuff that your wire bias is, is maybe similar, but you know, I think there's, you at least have a little bit more option in terms of if you can deliver the CSI and do it on the way back, you have more control there. Um, so with those kinds of angles, I think it, it probably does give you an advantage with that kind of curve because it's not such a spiral vessel that you're getting straightening artifact and you're really worried about shredding it. Um, I mean, those you, you're just higher risk with, with really any device probably, but yeah, I think you guys do a lot of both. What do you, how, what's your take on that? Yeah, so so I, I I think when the vessel is bigger than three millimeter, I tend kind of to reach for the CSI. The angulation it it, it just kind of dictate my wire choice. So this is the uh, the Viper Flex uh, tip wire, and which part of the wire I will leave in the lesion. So um, I, when a, you have a retroflex. Uh, um, uh, circ or you have a severe angulation, there are a risk with the floppy rota wire that the, actually the rota can actually get just go straight and sever the wire. I tend to use the supportive uh, rota wire in this situation, but I think it's going to here both have the risks, both have their advantages. Um, and they are a little bit different. And I kind of start remembering now what we did with this patient. <laughs> go ahead, Catherine. Okay, so after we um, we did um, sorry about that we did um, CSI of the circ. We then did IVIS. So we, here's our IVIS run, and this is an, a pullback from the LED, um, the mid LED to the left main. And I've kind of dove, done some freeze frames here um, on the side to just give you representative slices of what this case looked like. Um, and we see, you know, in the mid LED, we've got 270 degrees of calcium. The osteal LED is also quite concentrically calcified. And the mid left main actually um, has some soft plaque 
um, for sure, but it's actually relatively uncalcified um, when we get back to the mid left main. So um, we ballooned the, um, sorry, we ballooned the um, LAD back into the left main. Um, and then we deployed a Synergy um, 3538 to kind of take care of the distal LAD first. Um, and then I guess, you know, working distal to proximal, you know, the next thing we looked at is, okay, do we have to deal with this diagonal? Do we need to rewire and balloon? Um, you know, do we need to do any further assessment of this diagonal before we move back and kind of deal with the proximal vessels? So I don't know. Um, I don't know if anyone would, would go after this. There's Timmy three flow, but it's certainly got quite the pinch. Um, so, you know, we ended up doing an IFR of this vessel. Um, and so it was 0.94. So despite, you know, what looked certainly visually like a pretty um, significant stenosis, it wasn't physiologically significant. So we let that go. Yeah, um, that's really and then, good so we did feedback. I think, you know, we'll say for early on, especially all those things just validate your decision-making. So while it's a time efficiency balance, like if you're thinking of leaving it alone, that just always helps. But that's what they always say classically is that pinches visually look so terrible, but from a human dynamic standpoint, you know, they rarely are. And a lot of times they'll get better if it's just from shift to. Um, so then we started to do some ballooning. I've kind of picked up some representative ballooning here, but essentially we took a 3520NC and a 3020NC and did a kind of a variety of kissing balloon inflations involving um, the circ, the first obtuse marginal, and, um, and the LED. And so you can see, unfortunately, in this kind of last clip that um, the this Osteal circ, despite CSI, is still pretty underexpanded. This is still qu quite um, quite constrained there. So um, we went back and we did more CSI. So this is again another one where we treated backwards, and we did treat on high speed um, in this case. And this is the angiogram after that, and then a 3020 non-compliant balloon. So, um, you know, I think this was, this case also illustrated a lesson for me that even though you've done um, atherectomy once, you're not necessarily done. You kind of continually have to reassess and make sure you have the adequate lesion prep before moving on with your case, even if you're kind of on a roll and want to keep stenting. Uh, Michael McGalley raised his hand. So it seemed like a good moment to pause and I was going to let him talk and see if he had a question. Yeah. Yeah. Mike. Okay, you should be good. I think he's still muted. Hello? Hey Mike. Oh, yeah, I can hear you. What's up? Oh, you're muted again. So, so, yeah. I know something is wrong with my connection. <laughs> the Henry Ford rolling Wi-Fi outage is already affecting you. We could hear you for a second. Let's see if I can unmute him. It only will let me ask to unmute him. So I guess we can keep going and- um, Oh yeah, if you wanna text me your question, I can read it too, if you can't get unmuted. You should have the ability to talk whenever his mute is resolved. He looks muted uh, in my screen, so. Yeah. My interface will only allow me to ask to unmute, not to like unmute him directly. Okay. All right, so, um, so then our, our approach with this lesion was to, we, we were sure that we were gonna do um, bifurcation stenting of the distal left main into the LAD and the circ. And so, you know, with hopefully not having to deal with uh, the obtuse marginal unless we encountered a problem with it. So um, in that sort of setting, um, we tend to do a culotte with an option to tap the left mate, to tap the third vessel in um, if this size mismatch is not too extreme. Um, and so that was our approach here. So we started with a Synergy 3524 into the circ. 
um, we recrossed and did simultaneous kissing balloons into the LED. Um, and then here we are positioning um, the, our Synergy Megatron um, from the proximal um, LED into the left main. We deployed it in the caudal view just to make sure that we were in an appropriate location in the left main. And we had seen we kind of didn't have to exactly nail the os. We had a relatively healthy segment of the proximal left main. So it didn't feel passionately that we had to exactly nail the aortic os. Um, so then we swapped our wires. We did simultaneous kissing balloon inflations. Um, and then we did trifurcation balloon um, angioplasty here with a 3515 NC into the first obtuse marginal. And so um, I don't think I unfortunately have an angiogram of it, but unfortunately we did get a dissection after we did that and decided to go on to stent. So since this was um, an obtuse marginal, we did a tap um, from the with the OM1 into the circ. So here you see a 3020 stent, and then we did a tap um, from the circ with a 3530 NC. And so here you see um, final trifurcation simultaneous balloon inflation. And I just wanted to point out we actually downsized a bit here compared to what we had been using because we were we were doing trifurcation balloon ballooning and didn't want to overinflate the left main. I don't know if anyone wanted to kind of mention, you know, your thoughts on sizing. Um, also the other thing that I'll point out is we were radial through a seven French and we got all of these non-compliance in at the same time through a seven French. I was just about to ask that. I was like, I think you guys are radial. Yep. Yeah. So, um, so then this was our final result. And he did very well. Um, he was discharged home the next day. Oh, and I'm sorry, here's our final IBIS. Oh, gosh, I'm so sorry. I'll learn to use a computer someday. And so you see here, now we have our distal stent edge that's well expanded. This was the area of significant calcification. Um, and we see that coming in, we're well expanded throughout this area. Um, and as we're coming back proximally, we're encountering more calcium. Um, and there you see that was that we're hanging out kind of at the osteal left main um, where you see that second step coming in. And now that's the, we're kind of going in and out of the proximal to mid left main, checking out that proximal stent edge, which looks well opposed and well expanded. And so here's final wire out shots. It's a really fantastic result. Um, and I'm glad you showed the imaging there too. You know, a lot of times we see things in calcific disease that don't look absolutely perfect. So when you're going back in for your post ivus runs, how are you using that to make your decisions and what's sort of your criteria for, for doing more? Yeah, I mean, so I think one of the most important things we're looking for, especially in calcified disease is stent expansion. Um, and, you know, ideally we're hitting 90% of our reference stent size or based on our, our proximal and distal reference vessel, but um, you know, at least 80% stent expansion. And that's kind of, I think the, the threshold to go back and hit a little harder is just um, making sure we're adequately expanded. And of course, you know, really checking out those distal edges because you know, in big vessels like this with big stents, that's important. Yeah, for sure. I think if you're meeting that criteria and your MSA is over 5.5, five, five, you know, you've You've got, there's all the different ways that they did this in the trials, but they had a really hard time meeting the 90% reference area factors, but you know, they, they did more frequently meet these other measures and obviously the outcomes are still probably driven by that. So I think that's a good thing. The D-shaped stent, you know, the imaging people tell us that that matters less if it's perfectly round. So I think there are times where there's, despite all the atherectomy in the world, there's little shelf of calcium. It's not gonna look picture perfect there. Um, so that is kind of part of the, training ourselves not to overreact to that. And, you know, typically, you know, you guys have this practice too. It's like, we'll go choose a good size balloon and then go back and hit it hard if you need to do more work. But I don't think there's a lot of sense of re-itising many times, which is, is part of what people get into. 
Yeah, we, nowadays with IVIS, we face this problem, like you put a balloon, you expand the stents, you take the balloon, the stent kind of recoils again. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm yet to know what to do about those things and because you face them more actually in the proximal uh, circ um, uh, and, and than other vessels. And um, the IVIS, if you have 5.5 five, five, uh, lumen, you should be okay. Although we just have a um, patient who didn't do okay, despite the 5.5. Five. Um, and so I, I don't know what the answer to that. And, but I don't know what the answer what to do, like four or five millimeter balloon, 4.5 millimeter balloon, and it does expand it. And should I use five millimeter and shred the vessel, and open it, or would shockwave work in this situation? I, I, I really don't have the answer to that yet. Yeah, no, agreed. I mean, we certainly have all pushed it further just to have a perforation and have to deal with that too. So it's always a balance, but I think using it all the time and, and having that feedback, but obviously for, I think both on imaging and your angio, this is a fantastic result. And it's really a good testament to how doing atherectomy, you still have to check that we're going to have good expansion. Um, you know, I know with all the imaging discussion now, there's been a lot of talk about re-imaging to evaluate for fracture, which I can't say is our typical practice, but we're, we'll more typically do, you know, escalate to approximately one to one size MC balloon and, and check that way. But are you typically imaging after atherectomy to look for calcium fracture or just doing that with your balloons? Uh, we are imaging every time. So, um, so we are looking for the fracture, but uh, it's not enough. <laughs> Even yeah. because a lot of times you have actually calcium only on one side. Even if you don't fracture, even if you fracture it, you still kind of have that recoil factor. It's a fibrocalcific plaque. So we're looking for the balloon eventually, that the balloon expansion, the more. And it's like that the rule is 865, right? It's like eight millimeter uh, lumen area. Also, this is a note from uh, Nayal um, that you're looking for. Um, Intra, uh, intra uh, stent, eight millimeter left main, six and five, six LAD and or five LAD and four circ, right? <clears throat> yeah, so, exactly. Uh, Michael? Sorry, yes, sorry, I was driving. The connection was so bad. I, I, uh, that's a great case. And in that context, I just wanted to ask one question. As a comparison or a contrast to the first case, the eight French groin versus seven French radial, where, where do we have the, the boundary or the threshold to decide that we're going eight French groin versus seven French radial? That case is fantastic, trifurcation. I think it has, it, it, it carries everything that you would need in a big guy trifurcation right and everything could be done through a seven french radio right so what do you think well um, my attitude is i if i have a 10 french guide i will use it but like this time we started in radial i'm not sure why why we started radio i can't remember really why why did we pick radial did you have- i wanted to torture you uh, yeah, that's like was to torture me probably, but I don't think it makes a lot of difference really between eight French and seven French. It makes a difference between radial and groin, and um, and but you can put eight French in the radial if you want to in some certain population. Mm-hmm. So uh, to me, it's the most important to achieve a perfect PCI results and also to do meticulous access. If you go in a groin, you really have to do meticulous access. If you do meticulous access, I, if I have to bet, I bet the difference between radial and 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 um, femoral is gonna go away. Yeah, I think also. Um, do you think? Do you agree, Dr. Alaswad? I think doing working on the right versus the left also changes my approach. I really like if I'm going to war on an RCA, and especially if we're doing a lot of proximal work and osteo work, I think it can be really challenging to balance an AL in and out from the radial position. Um, and so I think, especially if I'm going to war with something like a bad shepherd's crook, a ton of calcium tortuosity, and I know I'm gonna be working in a challenging proximal RCA, I think I'm, I'm more likely to wanna be groin, 
just because balancing ALs in and out from the wrist can just be pain. Whereas yeah. with the left and you, you're going to get it, you're going to get, we use, we use pretty large guides. So this was a, an EBU-4. We pretty standardly use EBV, EBU-4s um, from the wrist. You know, once you get it in, it's going to sit pretty well and you don't have to be quite as active with the guide. So the right coronary artery story is going kind to, of, from a right radial, or from the radial in general, right coronary artery, unless you have a really good support to guide catheter, what happened, the diaphragm pulls the heart down and, uh, and the shoulder keeps the, the catheter up. So every time the patient take a deep breath, your guide will pop out, especially if you're using JR4 guide from right radial, which is terrible support. Uh, it, 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 the, the left radial for the right coronary artery actually works better, the guide, but the guide tend to dive deeper in the, in the RCA from the left radial, and it actually have a better support. The problem with that, uh, it, it's difficult to actually engage with an AL1, you have to use an AL.75 uh, from the left radial for some reason, it's, this is by trial and, and I, I found out that way. So, um, if you have a difficult lesions, you just, the most important thing is to get a good supportive guide. And if you can't get it from the radial, get it, but don't cut your, don't decrease your chances of success and increase your chances of frustrations and long time and lose your efficiency for one French. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, exactly. I can't remember in this guy too, if he'd had like a line and a hematoma or something already, but sometimes if there's other issues, I'm less married to it just because, you know, the radial complications when we do have them are, are such a mess too. Um, but I think you're right. A lot of it comes down to case planning. So, sorry, my dog. <laughs> that is, is upset. Apologies. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I... Again, not come first. Having been trained by Kate, I'm um, sure I can say what she was likely going to say, which is, sorry, my dog hates radial apparently, but no, the, uh, I think the factor is your case planning. So, and that one, I was thinking, you know, we're going to try to just do a one, seven, five, split the difference and, and be done. But if I'm worried we were going to use a bigger burr, cause that's what we had that day, or, you know, some of it is just about your strategies, but I think that's a great example of how much work you can do through a seven French, you know, if you have we in part didn't used to have some French guides on our shelf. And now that we do, I think we've gone radio a lot more. So it's a small change that increased our bandwidth that way. Yep, makes great sense. We have time for another case or? Yeah, I think we have 24 minutes. I think we could probably get through another one. Uh, mine is a pretty sh relatively straightforward um, left main. Um, Catherine, I don't know if you have strong preferences either way. I'm happy to walk through mine. Yeah, whatever you'd like. You can go ahead. You already have slides up, so. Yeah, maybe. Uh, my next case is a 75-year-old, very, very nice gentleman that actually Kate and I met over a weekend um, in July at the very beginning of my interventional year. He was 75, similar to my last case, no significant past medical history. I will say most of our patients had a lot of medical history. So my two cases are a little unusual in that way and that they were actually both quite healthy when they came to us. Um, he'd been having kind of classic angina for six months and then came into the hospital with an end STEMI with pretty minor troponin elevations. The, his troponin peaked at 0.28 um, and he had a normal EF with no wall motion abnormalities, but given his very classic anginal symptoms, we took him for angiography on a Saturday to take a look and see what was going on. And you can see here, he has a quite complex distal left main disease, which extends into, that looks uh, calcified and extends into the proximal circ and kind of this trifurcating LAD, high diag, high OM, maybe a small ramus, um, system. And the ario caudal, I think it better lays out that um, he's got this kind of shelf appearance coming off of his distal left main that looks fairly calcified. And his, in the crany views, he also has some mid LED disease as well as some disease of a fairly large, albeit diseased diagonal branch. 
he um, also, similar to um, some other cases we've discussed, had some moderate, not mostly non-obstructive RCA disease that kind of extended out into the bifurcation, but certainly the bulk of his disease was at the left main um, into his major left sided vessels. Um, he was actually really quite healthy. So we had him evaluated by cardiac surgery as well. Um, and they actually offered him a cabbage at the time, but he had some personal family issues that really necessitated him not being, re not recovering from an invasive procedure for six weeks. If I recall correctly, I think actually his daughter had cancer and he was helping take care of her children. And so he was just not in a place where he was going to be able to be in the hospital for seven days and have a big surgery and recover for it after. So declined um, a surgical intervention. So we had planned for left main PCI the following Monday. Um, so I think we can, you know, start this the way we've been doing the other ones, which is to kind of talk about the initial approach to a case like this. Uh, we had planned for left main, likely bifurcation PCI, the way that his distal left main proximal LED as well as his proximal circ were involved. And if his RCA needed any intervention at all to do it at a later date with physiology to guide things, because um, it wasn't clear that that was really as much of his issue. Um, and because of his age and his acute presentation, we did do a right heart cath, which was pretty unremarkable. So I don't know if um, people want to comment on that. I can certainly go back to his um, images if that would be helpful. So K Kate and Catherine, so this is this is a quadrification. Like you have how many branches? Can you go back to the column? <laughs> yeah. So, so I I think there is a very high diagonal. There is an LA. I I can't really tell from you. Oh, that septal. There's just a high septal. Okay. So you have basically. Uh, LED um, diagonal slash, I mean, ramus probably that has an osteal disease. And you have a significantly tight lesion in, um, in a, a proximal cirque. And the LED basically extend almost the, the plaque. If you put an IVIS, there will be a lot of plaque almost to the, after the first bend of the LED, right? So and you have a diagonal that actually at have higher risk of losing it. And this diagonal is large. So it's not really small diagonal. If the, if you shut down that diagonal, the patient gonna be hurting for days, if not longer, and he will hate you. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think that was a big reason why we thought cabbage was reasonable to consider in him is not the rest of it, but just like, what's our likelihood of a durable result where a lot of his disease territory that we're stenting across is the bulk of the branches supplied by his LED because that diag comes, you know, that whole way down the wall, but. Yeah. So what do you think, uh, uh, Catherine, Dr. Kunkel, what do you think? I, I would, what, what would you start your stent where you stop? What kind of strategy would you, we still yeah. have? few minutes to go and yeah so i'm i would really have a hard time not dealing with that second diagonal the really large one at the Me same too. time of dealing with this i think the likelihood of your of closing it down is high it's at least 10 the lesion kind of at the os is at least 10 millimeters long so i i think you're not going to get away with provisional light. i think there's actually a pretty high grade lesion in the middle portion of that diagonal so I think um, I think I would probably lean towards bifurcation stenting with this, you know, double bifurcation stenting because the left main is certainly going to be a bifurcation too. Um, double bifurcation stenting is never, you know, a total walk in the park, um, you know. And so, it, kind of, what strategies are you going to choose here for your both of your bifurcations and how will one bifurcation influence the other? That's kind of the initial kind of thoughts and approach that I would be taking when looking at this angiogram. Mm -hmm. From the surgical literature and the CD scan literature, if the diag 75 millimeter in length, that actually an important branch. 
So uh, any branch, 75. This is longer. This is almost reaches the, the infralateral wall, it's like infraabical area. So I will probably um, three, uh, eight French guide. That's definitely a French guide because you have double bifurcations. You might have to do now. You could, you can basically make it simple, treat the diagonal and um, provisionally at the ostium, uh, but you have to treat that lesion there and then treat the LAD circ. And um, I'll probably dilate the, the, uh, the ramus just to kind of keep it. And then if the patient have symptoms down the road, I can bring him and do something else. I can't wait until we have the, the agent balloon, which is drug coated balloon. This is, could be a good strategy here where you can use actually drug coated balloon in a diagonal, drug coated balloon in the ramus, and you do bifurcation stenting and the rest. Well, so we talk about how we anxiously await those are drug coated balloons on an almost daily basis. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So what did I, you guys do? Let, let I us can't know. I remember this case, so I look forward to seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like my case. Yeah, we had been up either. all night. I don't know. Yeah. I, don't yeah. know. I mean, and I guess yeah. that's the other thing that like the angiogram jumped out at me is, you know, I with the a distal left main stenting, you know, it's it's very it's a very wide angle, right? So, yeah. you know, thinking about like a culotte or a decayed crush, it's a it's you know almost a retroflex circ when you look at the angle from the LED to um, to the circ in the spider. So, you know, I think that, you know, I, we generally wouldn't do something like a, a tap in a left main, but, you know, that sort of, you know, doing stenting from the left main into the LED and, you know, doing a tap with the, you know, with the circ, it's just kind of a very, you know, 120 degree angle. Yeah. Um, yeah, Kate, this was the guy. Yeah, we'd been up all night on doing an axillary impella on a really sick patient. Um, and he like walked in and was like, I'm going to do great. God's on your side. And we were like, oh dear. <laughs> um, yeah, it's all coming back to me. It was <laughs> very, very sweet guy. Um, so we had upfront IVUS into the circ, um, and obviously you can see there's quite significant calcification. Um, I should have paused a still frame on the um, ostium itself, but I think when it plays back again, you can see right, you know, there how calcified it is. Though the um, it's, the lumen itself is almost over two millimeters. So I think we had some, we were initially unsure as to whether or not like a rotational atherectomy cap or even a two over would touch the walls like that. Um, so we did, um, we actually up front just, I don't think I actually put a picture of it in here. Um, but I will describe that we pre-dilated because we didn't, weren't sure that the atherectomy catheter would actually be able to modify that calcium given the vessel size. We did an initial pre-dil with a 3-0-NC, um, which fully expanded. And then we hit it again with a cutting balloon and then did a rotational atherectomy into the LED, which we couldn't pass anything beyond that shelf that you can see on the diagnostic images. Um, the one complication this gentleman did have was that around this time, our pharmacy, um, we had previously been putting nitroglycerin into the rotaglide just empirically. And right around this time, our pharmacy kind of put the kibosh on that and said that we couldn't do that anymore. And so when we did rotational atherectomy into the LED, kind of right afterwards, he started having some chest pain and ST segment changes and had some no reflow into the LED. Uh, fortunately, we were able to treat that with, we did some initial balloon angioplasty with a 2.0 balloon and then inserted a Corsair microcatheter to give intracoronary vasodilators into the LED. So we gave some nitroglycerin um, and Computers for them. Um, that it resolved his no refill. Fortunately, he remained stable through this. 
Yeah. I don't know if that makes a difference, but we had had it in our mix for so long that after this case, I've been, it was like literally one of the first ones after we made that change. So I'm a little bit more likely to give some puffs of nitro in between, but I don't, I don't know. What do you guys do? Do you pre-treat with aminophilin or any of that stuff too? Yeah, we treat with aminophilin. The thing about it, we put adenosine, nicardipine and nitroglycerin. And when you treat with aminophilin, the, the adenosine become ineffective, right? Mm -hmm. So, so um, uh, I twirled with the idea of no uh, vasodilators uh, because we were having hypotension. We use anesthesia, patient goes to sleep, blood pressure goes to 40 every time, we, especially with the CSI. But I think since I went back to putting vasoactive material in, um, in the flush, I had less no reflows. Yeah, that's interesting. We should have swapped these images, but um, after that, we were able to IVIS into the LED as well, which is seen here. Um, and we ended up treating the, uh, electing to treat that diagonal branch, which we agreed was, despite being diseased, it sub seemed to supply a substantial amount of, of myocardium. So we ended up just um, treating that with balloon angioplasty with a cutting balloon rather than doing double bifurcation stenting, which certainly would have been an, a reasonable approach. We then, gosh, I seemingly did not put these in order correctly. Um, we elected to proceed with a DK crush technique for all the reasons that were discussed previously. Um, and so stented the circ initially with a 3520 synergy and did an initial kiss to crush the circ stent, then rewired the circ. We did stent that mid LED with um, a 30 synergy and then extended back into the left main with a 35. and did the final kiss, and this was his final result. We did, um, we didn't put it in here, but we did do a final IVUS of the LED, and he had some under-expanded segments in the kind of proximal to mid-LED, so we did end up hitting that again with a 401C to further post-dilate it. And he did very well. He discharged, I don't think the next day, but I think the following day after that. So this is this is very, very important. Like if you have a side branch and avoid making things complex, you can actually do balloon angioplasty. You do not have to stint every side branch or something. So this diagonal uh, is important. You actually got a very good result with balloon angioplasty, I can tell. And that's good enough. Um, it's well restenosed, probably 30% restenosis rate. Um, but believe it or not, in, a, in the era of balloon angioplasty and bare metal stents, and every, if you achieved really good results uh, um, with balloon angioplasty, those tend to be durable too. And it's like target vessel revascularization um, uh, beyond the first three months, it's actually became similar um, if it stays open. You got yeah, a lot of territory. It's, yeah, it's a big enough territory. I think you could certainly argue to do that differently, but um, you know, we sort of decided to, it looked reasonable enough. We decided to let him earn a further intervention there, just figuring he, he could come back with that. But I, I think you could argue either way, it's a big enough territory. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've been arguing my, with myself this whole time, what bifurcation strategy I would even choose if you were to send that. Mm -hmm. Right, because you know, it almost is one of those. He had enough calcific disease right there too. You know, I'm always mindful because of our brachytherapy referral bias that we see too of like these stents where we kind of mess up the LED in that territory, but because of the strategy or you get something pulled off that, that's imperfect. So, not saying that that would necessarily happen, but just because that that was the part we kind of struggled for stent optimization. 
anyway, we elected to leave that um, just to prioritize the LED. But I think it's one of those where I'd be willing to leave a gap uncovered with drug too, and just you have a target there. And if you get through stenosis, you can you know, deal with that um, and take that hit rather than overcomplicating the, the bifurcation there. But yeah, I think reasonable people would disagree. The, the best the best strategy in, in this angulation would have been DK crush. Mm -hmm. They would have had to do two DK crushes, yeah. which is really painful. <laughs> in one patient, um, it's not really, um, it's not really a good uh, a good strategy. It's a it's a long and arduous uh, arduous procedure. So I I I completely agree with your strategy, Kate. Perfect. So this is uh, this is a wonderful. I I loved it. I uh, first of all um, I, I enjoyed um, the presentation of the my case that I did I completely forgot about, and I enjoyed one. Catherine uh, Dawson. Uh, we have two Catherines. They spell it differently, um, and we have Kate, Catherine, Catherine, and Kate. So mm -hmm. it's it's a uh, it's amazing. Something in the 1980s when you were born, so something was happening. Uh, Catherine's Catherine, Kate. So I do but, generally uh, tell people that if you're meeting a woman who was born in the 1980s, there's like a decent chance her name is Katie or Ashley. Uh, actually, actually, doc, Dr. Catherine Kunkel told me that story. I, I didn't make it up. There are, uh, there were 12 Catherines in my medical school class. Yeah. So she told me that and, and, and she proved it by that example. <laughs> and now that's another example. So that's amazing. And I, and I love this. Uh, this is really very helpful to us and very helpful to our fellows and very helpful to our audience to see like where you guys in the, all the way in the Northwest, we are here very close to the East Coast, but we're not East Coast, but let's kind of see how similar we think, how similar we approach things. And, and um, the audience, Dr. Nayal had the excellent um, uh, comments here. I love him. Uh, and, um, and Dr. Migali uh, engaged us from his car. So that's a lot of dedication. So if, no, if uh, nobody has any questions, we'll just sign off. No, I'll just say it's so helpful for us to see, you know, see a different strategy and how people do things too. We learn a lot from that. So I appreciate you guys sharing and taking the time to hang out with us today. Yeah, it's a, a it's a beautiful, I, I know. Uh, it's a, it's a really great to see you, Kate. And uh, I'd like to remind everybody here, you're originally from Michigan. So that greatness <laughs> yeah. started somewhere. <laughs> absolutely yeah hopefully we'll see you guys soon all right hopefully we can get to, to meet in person soon all right goodbye everybody bye, -bye. bye thank you very much